The brew house was created to capture and share with you the long history of the Genesee Brewery. But the brewery itself isn't half as interesting as the beer and the people who make it. Visit GeneseeBrewHouse.com. Hello everyone and welcome into the Rochester Press Box here from the mighty Genesee Brew House. Our pleasure to have you with us and our pleasure to welcome back Bob Blyer, former National Football League quarterback out of Aquinas. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Mike Catalano co-hosting yep. and it is our pleasure to have Nate Rowan from the Rochester Red Wings in here sitting in for Pat Duffy, the mustachioed. Yes. Nate Rowan. Thanks for having uh, me. What's the occasion? Uh, I grow it out every November, raise money for the Movember Foundation, which raises money for prostate cancer research and other men's health issues. Is it supposed to look good? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're succeeding. <laughs> hey, let's, let's talk a little bit head coaching. We have, uh, Bobby, we've got the young guy out in L.A., McVay, coaching. He's 31 years old, head coach of an NFL team. Uh, the same week that the New York Yankees make up some lame excuse talking about connectivity and replacing Joe Girardi as the manager there, which, you know, is telling that they want to get young. It's become a young man's game. I, is this like changing right before our eyes? Well, here, here's, here's my biggest fear of all the professional sports becoming a young man's game. Um, you, you've got, I just heard news that uh, Ohio University just uh, had, had their group women's field hockey team go to the president, ask to have the coach ousted. He left. He got, he got removed. Now we hear, have Joe Girardi, who's dealing with a, a number of young athletes. He's averaging 91 wins a year in 10 years, six postseason trips. Maybe he, he can't connect with the young guys. Maybe they expect more playing time. I just have a problem with the younger players, the younger athletes, having such a large voice in the professional sport. Yes, yeah, some of that's on them, isn't it? They have to connect with Joe Girardi. I don't buy that it's an age thing at all. I think that's an excuse. I think any coach that uses that is using an excuse. You look around. Does anybody talk about Terry Francona's connectivity with his players? Does anybody talk about Pete Carroll's connectivity with his players? I don't think so. And I do think that might have been an issue with Joe Girardi. I don't think it has to be age. I think, I, you know, I'm, I, you watch different coaches and the way they relate. I think there's an impression that Sean McDermott is 29 years old because he's so yeah. enthusiastic. His connectivity, I think, is different than Sean McVay's. I think he's honest and he's upfront. So I, I think it can be an excuse to say it's age, but I do think it's incumbent a little bit on a manager or a coach. You want to stay relevant. And I think Pete Carroll's a good example of that. You want to stay relevant? then you figure out a way to connect with the athlete, just like coaches have done in past years. In Joe Girardi's sense, you're kind of the, the baseball guy. Is it Joe's fault? Uh, well, I think the game is changing so much. I think every single sport is, has changed to the point where front offices are expecting managers to do more than they've ever needed to do in the past. I think understanding analytics is the biggest of those concerns. And so the younger generation, or at least that's the general consensus, is that they are more willing to, to take analytics into their decision-making processes, but I think there are older uh, coaches and members of the staff that are able to take the analytics and use their old-school kind of managing style and kind of work them in. Um, but I think, you know, for Girardi's sake, unfortunately, he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and they were looking for a reason to get rid of him. I don't necessarily think that he uh, had disconnect with his players. I mean, when he got fired, a lot of the players came out and said how much respect they had for Joe Girardi, and whether that was just pandering to the media, who knows. But uh, he he is one that I think was a scapegoat for just the front office wanting to bring in a new regime. So I look at uh, I look at Andy Reid, look at Phil Roof, not right. that long ago as manager of the Red Wings. Um, Darden hired just got another gig yeah. in Detroit. I mean, I, I think Bill, it's honesty. I think if you are true to who you are, whoever that is, I think you will connect with your players. And I really do think that's the case. And I think the best coaches, I mean, I mean, Bill Belichick has connectivity with his players. It's in the Bill Belichick way. And I think that's the, that's the thing I've been impressed with Sean McDermott. He, you know exactly where he stands. He, I think he's honest with the players. There's this impression, and I go back to him, there's this impression he's this tough guy. And this, no, I think, he's, he's, I think they know where he stands all the time. And I think Joe Girardi, to me, has a little curmudgeon -y 
quality to him. I think Joe Torre related to his players more than Joe Girardi did. It's just my opinion. I'm not surprised, and I think that really was a factor with the Yankees. So how young is too young and how old is too old then? <laughs> Professional sports, give me numbers. Uh, that's actually <laughs> impossible. Yeah. Impossible to answer. I think uh, I love the older guys, like Andy, yeah. Andy Reid. Right. He's a player's coach. Pete Carroll, player's coach. You know, you come in as a rookie, you got, actually you know the drill, you know the style, you know the system, you're on board or you're not, and if yeah. you're not, you leave. Yeah. And I we're mean, seeing that at, a lot now, too. They're getting we, rid of players that aren't on board. You mentioned McVay, too. He, he's not just young. He's smart, and he's a good coach, and he has transformed that franchise when, you know, I mean, let's be honest, previous administration looked like they had no idea what they're doing in terms of that team. So age is a factor, but it's great to be young. Adam Gaze is young, and he looks disconnected yeah. in Miami. But the Rams, under Jeff Fisher, were a 500 team at best for most of the years while he was their coach. Now all of a sudden, they come out and they're better than maybe people expected them to be in his yeah. first year, and now he gets all this credit for being a, a great coach. Well, he's an offensive guy too, so yeah. I think systems have everything to do with it. Sure. And he's exploiting the strength of that quarterback. Golf right, is so my tough. theory's dead. Sure. It's not a <laughs> no. game. No, and you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm saying is if you're an older person in whatever walk of life, I don't know, present company included, don't allow your age to be that. Adjust, but be who you are, and I think you'll still connect. Wow. Man, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> this is Rochester Press Box, and we are at the Genesee Brew House talking Buffalo Bills next. Press Box, brought to you in part by Connors and Ferris, your workers' comp attorneys. Call 262-COMP-COMP today. Welcome back. We're at the Genesee Brew House. This is the Rochester Press Box. In this segment, our Buffalo Bills segment brought to you by Connors and Ferris. So, feels like they're coming off a bye week. Yeah. It's been 10 days since the Bills played. Tough team coming into Buffalo. New Orleans Saints are two and a half point favorites. Yeah, and I tell you what, the Saints are a different team. I think they're a slightly better version of the Buffalo Bills, and you wouldn't have thought of that. They've had Drew Brees. They don't play defense. Well, they do play defense, and now they run the ball. And I think they are, normally I'd be looking, as I talk to you guys, about a team coming in, you know, feeling, whatever. Uh, I think they're a combination of the most, uh, the cockiest quarterback and head coach in the NFL. I really do think that's the case, but I think it plays well for them. I mean, Sean Payton believes, I do think he believes he invented the game of the fo National Football League. I think he think, thinks he's that smart. And when he's going well, like he is right now, that's a good thing for them. Drew Brees, extremely confident quarterback, and things are going well, and they're not all on him. That team feels good about themselves, and that makes them dangerous coming in. They're not laying down against the Bills, which we've seen other teams do in the past. So I think it's a tough one for them. They play in the Dome, uh, you know, and you think automatically soft team, and New Orleans doesn't have a great record in cold weather. Is that a factor? Not at all. And the reason I'm saying that is because if you look at what New Orleans has done this year, like Mike said, they can run the ball this year. Yeah. You know, Breeze usually has to come from behind, throw for three, four hundred yards, three, four touchdowns. That's not their MO this year. The Saints are a strong team on both sides of the ball. They can score and outscore teams, but now when they have the lead, they can run the ball. They can run clock, yeah. and that's going to be dangerous for the Bills. I'm taking New Orleans minus two and a half. I think, it's, I think they're going to win by more than that. Who do you like? I'm taking the Bills for the one reason is I think this is a bit of a referendum on them, a quick referendum, as in were you the team we saw very consistent for seven games or were you the disaster we saw at the Meadowlands? I think it is a tight, tight game for them. 
but I like them as a home dog in this one. I'll take the Bills to win by a field goal. All right, I'm going to flip it too. I'm going with Buffalo because I like them at home. How do you see it? I'll take the Saints minus two and a half. Um, the Saints have only allowed 20 points or more one time this season, which seems incredible because you think of a team that doesn't play any defense and out, needs to outscore teams. My concern with the Bills would be they haven't beaten a team over 500 yet this year. The best team that they've beaten record-wise has been the Falcons. They were 4-4. Four and four. They need to prove it to me that they can hang with these, with these good teams. They've beaten the teams that they've needed to beat with the exception of last week. They probably should have beat the Jets. But until they do so, I'll go, I'll go with the team that they're playing, and they need to prove it to me that they're able to hang with these good teams in the league. Okay, my favorite part about this is the team is fun to watch again. Because you're yeah. really looking forward to every week seeing the Buffalo Bills play. Uh, pick a second game for me. Um, somehow the Cowboys are three-point underdogs against Atlanta, and the Falcons really haven't impressed me this year. I'll take the Cowboys, plus three. All right, I'm going to take a home field, Washington playing Minnesota, getting a couple points. I'm going to take Fitz and home field Tampa down a little bit. The Jets coming off that big win. I think Fitz beats the Jets this week outright. The Jets are favored on the road. How Isn't far have we something? come? Isn't that something? <laughs> but the, hey, nobody reacts quicker than Vegas. Vegas knows in that sense. I'm going to take Fitz. What's your pick? I think Pittsburgh minus 10 against the Colts. Minus 10. I think, uh, I think Ben, he had a great game against them last Thanksgiving, and I don't think Brissett's uh, plugged into their system yet in, in Indy. I think they're going to win big, 34-10. Alrighty, Duffy, who's usually in the seat, is leading our, our contest by a game over Mike. Classy Wolf Media donates $500 to Hunter's Hope at the end of the football season in the name of our Pick the Games contest. This is the Rochester Press Box presented by the Genesee Brew House. We are at the Genesee Brew House, and this portion is brought to you by Connors and Ferris. Like it or not is next. Welcome back to the Rochester Press Box from the Genesee Brew House. Like it or not, I bet you like it. Uh, Aquinas is back on top of Section 5 football after a, a one-year absence, so they didn't even make the tournament. That's Aquinas, great. Uh, you know what? It's, it's, it's really good stuff. I think Section 5 football is good when Aquinas is good. Um, I am so thrilled for Derek Anicino. He's been a friend uh, for, for a very, very long time. They tried to create a new culture at Aquinas. Um, they eliminated a lot of the, uh, the negativity. Uh, Derek's message is getting through. The players are responding. They're not a big team. They're a fast team. They're very athletic. And they've done a great job. I, I wish them well in the state tournament, but, but Aquinas is back on the... On, it was really on, an aberration that they missed last year, wasn't it? It was. It was, it was kind of ironic. It, I, I mean, it, they weren't clicking on all cylinders. I don't know if it's because Chris was going to be leaving this year. Chris Battaglia, who's at uh, Rondequoit now. I'm not sure what it was. The dynamics just didn't feel right. This year, they are clicking on all cylinders. Even after that opening week loss to Victor, they came back and, and, and beat Victor to... Um, put themselves into a great position. I've said it to you many times. I think it's great when Victor or when Aquinas is good. It rises, what is it? High tide rises all boats, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, I mean, Pittsford hung right in there with him. Victor knocked him off this year. It's not like you go and you see the games and you go, come on. They've got all the kids and they do this. Right. No. Right. I think Section 5 football, competitive-wise, especially the big schools, is fantastic. It's been. And the coaches have all done a great job. And, and Aquinas is the one you want to knock off. And you've seen a lot of Section 5 this yeah, year. Yeah, especially Double A, and they earned it this year. It wasn't a, a year where it was down and there was there was maybe one competitive team. They had to earn it. They were the third seed in Double A this year. They had to beat Victor the two seed and Pittsburgh the one seed. They had five teams in Double A this year. They had one loss. 
I mean, McQuaid had one loss, had to go on the road for the first, the quarterfinal round of, of sectional play. Yeah. They really earned it this year, which is even more impressive. And means that they're, they're, they're for real. And you're right. And how good for Pittsburgh. And they're so competitive. But Pittsburgh was very close to obviously getting knocked off by McQuaid. They had to make right. that major comeback. So I think the Section 5 football was excellent this year. Quickly, like it or not, uh, involving Eli Manning, is yeah. it time for Davis Webb? I think it's time to see if there's something else there because they're going to have to make a quick decision. If you think about it, is it Davis Webb? Because the Giants may very well end up with a high, high draft pick. The blame is not on Eli. Look, Eli's not been great, but that team is terrible. Ben McAdoo has lost that team. It really did appear that week. I think it's worth giving the other guy a shot. Eli was in this spot before, if you remember, even though he was the high pick, you know, when a guy named Kurt Warner was the Giants quarterback and they benched him halfway through the year and they let Eli play. And that team was somewhat in contention. So, yeah, I think Eli for the really should probably sit down, but it shouldn't be the blame on him. It should go on the coach. Bob, you can't understate the, the, the significance of a quarterback change in an NFL team, can you? Agreed. You know, the, the one thing I'm, I'm seeing from Eli that I haven't seen in quite some time is you, can, you read his face when things go wrong. He doesn't seem like that old leader he used to be. He falls into that those doldrums along with his team yeah. and his players. He's he's not that rallying leader anymore. Con, you know, uh, conversely, I was at the Broncos Eagles game this weekend, and Carson Wentz seems to be the real deal to me. Is it like chicken and the egg thing though. Did the team drag him down, or did he drag the team down? That's that's a tough one, but uh, I think he's a, he's a function of all the stuff that's going You're wrong. You're right, and I do think Eli's been bad. I'm saying is it's not like the blame should just go on him, but they have to be looking at the future. This is the Rochester Press Box, presented by the Genesee Brew House. Unfinished Business is next. Duncan has lots of fall favorites to root for. Maple pecan, pumpkin, maple sugar bacon. But on game day, we root for one team. One team, baby. Win the fall, folks. Welcome back. This is the Rochester Press Box from the Genesee Brew House. Dunkin' Donuts brings us Unfinished Business America Runs on Duncan. Nate, start us off. Congratulations to the 2017 World Series champion Houston Astros. They built it from within. They built it through trades. Everything that they did to build that team went as perfect as they could have hoped for. My concern is that the way that they did it was that they sacrificed three to four years where the team was completely not competitive in the game of baseball. It concerns me because this type of approach works for a franchise. It clearly works, and the Astros hit the nail on the head with every move that they made to get to this point. My concern is that teams are going to copy this and that we'll see more and more teams completely trying to get rid of t players and it, it's not good for the competitive balance of any league and it's not just baseball, other sports, we're starting to see teams do it. I have concerns with the way that the Astros built their team and obviously it works because they were World Series champions this year. Well, you know, they're the ones that are late to the game. I mean, every other sport deals with it on a tighter time, time span, I think. I'm surprised it took this long for baseball to realize that that does work. Right, right. And that's the, the, the thing is, is it works. And that's why it's a concern to me, because other teams are going to start to copy that, that mold. And when there's just teams that are not competitive in any sport, it's just not good for the game. Yeah, yeah. but it, Sports Illustrated It only years, works if you make the right decisions. Correct. And bring in the right players. It's too easy to just say, lose games, and then you get good. Look at the Cleveland Browns. Right. It's not working. That's sure. always the example, yeah. isn't it? Bob, what do you got? Uh, for those of you out there who are, are large football fans, who has a team that maybe has a mediocre quarterback, Mike and I have been discussing this for out, throughout the day. Um, one of the things that I, I, would, I would ask for you to research is look at the depth of your quarterback position on your team. You look at the Patriots last year, Tom Brady missed four games, 
Garofalo goes in and goes 2-0, and, oh, and then Brissett goes in after a Garofalo injury and goes 1-1. One and one. They go 4-1 and one without their starter, they go 14-2 and two for the year, and they eventually win the Super Bowl. I'm, my encouragement behind a team that I really like is to see the depth at that position, and I think a lot of teams are ignoring that um, and relying heavily on starters. I think more teams in the NFL need to, to, to look at second teamers, third teamers, especially if they have no chance this year to make the playoffs. But Mike and I talk about this all the time, and we disagree. There aren't enough. There just aren't enough. Right? enough. So the Patriots well, are just different. There are enough <laughs> great quarterbacks, but you, if you look at Green Bay right now, obviously you lose Aaron Rodgers. But they have not gotten good play behind him at all, and that's why know. they've been losing. And now that may take them right out of the playoffs. But would Garoppolo or Brissett have made a difference if they were in Green Bay when, when he goes down? Uh, it couldn't have been much worse than it's been right yeah. now. They've got to be pretty disappointed. Uh, we lost a great one this week. Doc Holliday, Roy Halliday, the pitcher from the Blue Jays and then from the Phillies, passed away in a tragic way in a plane crash, a plane that he was flying down in Florida. And you see a player like him, and you knew he was great, and you know that he's likely going to end up being a Hall of Famer. And we saw the no-hitters in the perfect game and no-hitter actually in a playoff game. And you realized who he was. But he was different in many ways and now when you see the tributes to him we can tell sometimes when the tributes are a typical one good guy hard worker and everybody loved him it was a little different with this guy you heard players talk about they've never seen anyone work like the guy not a self-promoter at all barely smiled on the mound a competitor and the biggest thing about him as a pitcher was when he started a game he wanted to finish a game it was old school and that's the way he was and that's a legacy he left with a lot of players you heard players that were his teammates and you heard players that went against him of how much respect they had for him it's a shame the last photo everybody saw was a picture he took with his sons and their teammates and like a little league team winning a championship big smile on his face he won't have that going forward certainly with his family and condolences to his family but for the game of baseball, that is a guy to emulate, and many players already have, and it'll even be more so now in his death. All right, Unfinished Business brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts. Bobby, thanks for joining us. Nice to have you back. We'll I'll do it again. See we'll you again soon. Football talk. <laughs> see Michael, as always, great thanks. job. Thanks, Nate. You bet, Bill. All righty. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week with the Rochester Press Box.